one of the nice things about this job is that I get to judge some very, very good contests, and this being the National Pork Cookout King Contest, as well as get some uh, interesting ideas to pass on to you. In this particular contest, there are 10 gentlemen from uh, different parts of the country that are participating, and Don Doherty is from South Dakota. That's correct, ma'am. And what are you cooking? I have a um, centerloin stuffed with prunes and apples and cooked in wine and cream sauce. Now, what do you serve with this? Uh, Actually, the, the the dinner itself is, uh, this is quite basic. It, it performs uh, two things. It's, it's a delicious dinner and it's an attractive dinner. And I usually have a simple salad and uh, uh, maybe uh, old greens. Now, I doubt that there are ever any leftovers, but if there are, uh, are they good? Ma'am, I don't have any leftovers. I've got six kids. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Joe Stebley is from Wisconsin, and what are you cooking? I'm cooking a roast pork tenderloin with a honey buster sauce. It's honey, butter, and a little mustard. About how long does it take to cook this? Oh, about three hours. And do you have a problem with uh, slow or fast heat? Does it have to be uh, very steady? Uh, it should be steady. It should be steady, and uh, I selected a medium heat right now. What do you serve with it? Uh, usually baked potato and uh, probably... Uh, French uh, style beans with butter and a uh, little of uh, these uh, prepared uh, onion rings. And I'm looking forward to the time that I get to taste it. Thank oh, you very thank much. You. And Mr. Nash, yes. you have a variety of things here. <laughs> yes, I do. Uh, you are from Indiana, and could you describe the various things that you are preparing? Well, I'm cooking uh, pork chops, spare ribs, and these are um, little livers wrapped in uh, bacon. They're kind of a, uh, an hors d'oeuvre, you know. Yeah. How long does it take to uh, cook the uh, hors d'oeuvre? About as long as it does the pork chop. So this this gives something to nibble on, though, if you That's start right. right. That's right. You put, I almost generally at home, I put them on early and take them off, and they have something to chew on. Thank you, Mr. Nash from Indiana. David Amen is from uh, North Carolina, and those look like ham slices. That's correct, center cut ham steaks. And how do you prepare them? Well, I have the center cut fresh ham steaks cut one inch thick, and then I grill them for about 20 to 25 minutes over a rather hot fire. And then I make a, a, a sauce up while they're grilling in a saucepan over here. And the sauce consists of half cup of muscadine wine, which is a, a wine grown in, in uh, down in North Carolina, and it has a half cup of currant jelly with it and one tablespoonful of prepared mustard. And then I serve the uh, ham steaks with lettuce and crab apples, and two real good dishes that go with this are potato salad and string beans. Sounds delicious. How do you tell when the steaks are done? Well, just by appearance, really. Uh, after you watch them, they, they begin to brown on the outside, and you have to just check to see how they're coming along. Uh, with the cooking. Now, are these pre-cooked ham slices or not? No, this is fresh ham. Von Willer is from Missouri, and is this a pork roast? Yes, ma'am, sure is. What, what have you done special to it? Well, the secret is the seasoning spices. Uh, we use a fennel seed mixed with our spices, which is an unusual spice that's used with pork roast. Normally, it's uh, used with the sausage line but it makes a very different and very unusual and very delightful taste in this loin roast. Now, is this particularly good cold and sliced later? Yes, ma'am. You, uh, you can, the idea behind it is for time saving and the fact that you uh, pack all of the seasonings in the center of the roast before you put it on. As you put it on and forget it, you relax and enjoy it, then later by using it either hot or cold, and you can use it for a hot meal or also for a buffet style, which I've set up here today. Larry Casey from Illinois is ready for us to, of course, taste. And uh, as you open that up, what, uh, could you show us, what do you have in there? This is a uh, seasoned bread uh, dressing. Uh, it's made out of uh, dried bread crumbs and uh, seasoning, uh, celery salt, onion salt, uh, some Larry seasoned salt, uh, bouillon, uh, chicken bouillon has the uh, water in it, 
put in fairly dry. Now, about how long does it take to cook? Uh, about 45 minutes. I let them cook just a little bit longer today, uh, being talking to everybody that come by. I let it cook just a little bit longer so I wouldn't have to watch them so close. But they'll cook in 45 minutes, okay. Mm -hmm. John Nagel is from Wichita, Kansas, and uh, you're a bachelor, but you have something that all the homemakers, I think, that uh, have busy lives will be interested in. Right. I'm cooking a, hop, a Whopper burger today, and it's made from sausage, and I cook two patties of sausage. And then uh, in between it, I put uh, either cheese and onion. If you don't like onion, you can leave it out, but I prefer onion. It's very cheap, it's economical, and it's just so simple to make, and the kids really enjoy it. Uh, how long does it take to uh, uh, grill it? It takes about 15 to 20 minutes is all. I cook it over a very slow fire because this uh, sort of seals in the juiciness because pork has a tremendous flavor. And I use a barbecue sauce on the outside, and uh, this helps add a little bit of moisture to it. And we certainly like our meat moist when we eat it. Now, I notice that you have them in the large one, too, because then actually if you have small children, you can quarter them down and they, they could uh, eat just exactly how much they want. Right. In fact, uh, you can feed a family of four with a pound and a half of sausage in this manner. Ed Farwell is from Illinois, and you have a very nice uh, dressing here. Yes, I uh, make that out of the tenderloin, pork tenderloin. And I boil, for the dressing, I take and I uh, cut the tenderloin up into small pieces and boil it. And then I use this broth to make my moisture for my dressing. And that's for the dressing on top of the butterfly pork chop. On top of them? Yes. Mm -hmm. I use it on top of them. I cook my uh, uh, pork chop first. And then after I have it cooked and I have the dressing already prepared just so I can put it on top of it, and then I set it on the stove with, wrapped in aluminum foil. And this way, I finish cooking it that way. And I put a little dab of butter on the top of it to make it extra good. <laughs> right, now you have an also a special sauce here. Yes, barbecue sauce that we make up myself. What are some of the ingredients in that? Uh, some of the ingredients is uh, green pepper, onion, uh, mustard, French's mustard, uh, yellow mustard, and tomato paste, and vinegar, and a few others. <laughs> Thank you. We have oven meals for a long time, but Robert Wolf from Nebraska has prepared a grill meal, or I would call it a grill meal. Yes, I have uh, potatoes and corn, uh, beets, onions, and pork chops. Now, what special do you have with the pork chops? Um, well, they're, uh, there's uh, honey and uh, thyme, dry mustard, and uh, fruit juice mixed together and uh, braced onto the pork chop. Now, how much difference was there in the time that you put on uh, the vegetables on to cook uh, compared to the chops? About 35 minutes. The, ch the chops were on 35 minutes before? No, no, after. after. The vegetables were on first. And you just wrapped them in the foil and sealed them? Yes. And now the bread? The bread, it's just uh, uh, garlic bread with some cheese on it and warmed up. You guys just took the chops off of the grill and, and I just had one taste. They're very good. Could you tell me the way you cook them, including the sauce? The sauce is a cranberry raisin sauce using cranberry fruit juice uh, cocktail and uh, the dried raisins. I put the, ch or the chops on the grill for 45 minutes on a low heat. Then I put the sauce on on just one side for the remaining 15, 20 minutes. This takes a salty taste out of these smoked pork chops and gives us the sweet taste of real good pork. It's so moist inside. That's part of the cookery and the quality of meat and uh, not just the sauce going all the way through. No, it is from cooking it very slow, which is a necessity on pork. Otherwise, you'll burn the outsides and the insides will be raw. And I might say, John, that you have a very, very nice display here because you have corn on the cobs and potatoes. Thank you very much. It was kind of hard to find corn this time of the year, but we found some. So. <laughs>
Dr. Benjamin Spock uh, recently participated in the Greek Week program at Iowa State. He had a rather hectic time in Iowa between making all the schedules throughout Iowa City, I think. Uh, was it a Grinnell, Iowa City, and finally Iowa State? Yeah. No, it was Drake. Drake, right. And uh, this is trying to do it in spite of the air controller's uh, uh, slowdown. This is what's really made it exciting. Plus the fact that my office double dated me having me speak in New York and in Iowa City the same night. Even without an, an air controller strike, you can't do that. Now, this leads me to something, though, that I, we did not talk about prior to this. Uh, how do you manage to uh, meet such a rigid schedule and with enthusiasm, you don't look tired or any of these things? I'm terribly proud about this, actually. Sometimes the executive director of the Civil Liberties Legal Defense Fund, for whom I travel and uh, speak and raise money, sometimes comes with me, and he's only 25 years of age, and he keeps collapsing uh, with exhaustion, wanting to go home to bed, and I keep going on and on. And you know, especially as you get older and older, you're prouder and prouder to, to be thought of as uh, spry. Well, actually, to be serious about it, one is that uh, I'm mo mostly speaking about the ending the war in Vietnam and the right to dissent, which is uh, an absolutely crucial subject uh, that s inspires me to go on and on. Then the other part, and I think this is even more important, is that young people think of me as their friend and they greet me enthusiastically. And in the auditorium at uh, Iowa State, uh, this huge, beautiful auditorium was absolutely jammed right up to the rafters uh, with students, and uh, they gave me a standing ovation. I used to be just an ordinary professor in a medical school at Western Reserve Medical School until I was forced by age to retire two years ago. I wasn't particularly popular there, just an average professor. The kids find out wh what you've got to say, your limitations and your old stuff. Now I go from university to university, only staying for one day. Uh, they assume that I'm on their side, their friend, uh, because I was indicted and convicted for, uh, for a while for a, a resistance uh, to the war. And uh, so I get these glowing, enthusiastic, noisy responses, and this is marvelous. How many old people in retirement uh, can get a standing ovation every night? So this buoys me uh, on, and uh, then after I've done it for a month, uh, then I suddenly realize I am a little wilted, uh, and then I go off and uh, sail a boat in the Virgin Islands for a month. This is a good life, too. It's a sort of a baked Alaska life, uh, rushing around, uh, being received enthusiastically, getting up at 6 o'clock in the morning in order to get the plane out, uh, never getting through with the last meeting until 12 o'clock at night, and then down in the Virgin Islands, everything is quiet, serene, warm, deep blue water, snorkeling. Uh, my wife and I talk very little. Uh, we sleep a lot. Uh, we snorkel two hours a day. Strangely silent, uh, warm life compared to the uh, noisy, talky life. Now, uh, I want to know more about that, but I also want to know more about uh, your uh, book. And I question this, is this at a time that you also write the book, is when you're in this, the setting of that quiet? Um, well, I have to write uh, whenever I can write. And uh, actually, I do a lot of writing on uh, planes. Strangely enough, uh, if I'm on a plane ride for more than an hour, this is a good place to write because there's no distractions. So you can't go and turn on the radio. You can't go and look at the newspaper. You can't uh, go to the bathroom uh, too often. Uh, you can't shop in pencils. So, you know, you can't distract yourself. The laundry man doesn't come. People don't telephone you. You don't remember people that you have to telephone. Uh, in the Virgin Islands, uh, I've written uh, quite a lot, though I'd much rather not. And uh, in Maine, I cruise, I mean, in summer, I cruise in Maine. And uh, uh, I've written, when I force myself to, I can write there, too. Uh, so I write any old time that I can write. I think uh, when you're keyed up and having to get an awful lot done, you can be a lot more efficient and you can... Uh, you can do surprising things, whereas when you're in a relaxed state, uh, you don't accomplish so much. 
you were identifying uh, for me one of the surprises that's expressed by people in some of your writings that uh, they really don't expect you to take some of the position that you do on obscenity. Right. In this book, uh, Decent and Indecent, uh, which contains at least five themes that I think are very important, and obscenity would be one of the least important, and yet that one has been seized on by more people. People are not only surprised, they're shocked. They're morally shocked that an educated man who considers himself a liberal or a radical could be opposed to obscenity. This is reactionary, uh, they think. Uh, they just can't believe it. It's indecent for me to be against uh, obscenity. Well, I think I always have to explain, first of all, I don't want to take away people's fun. Uh, I like to look at girly magazines, and uh, I like to hear jokes, if they're funny at all, even though they're uh, shady. I think that uh, the stage that we've gotten to in the United States is not an emancipation simply from old-fashioned Puritanism or old-fashioned Victorianism. I think that we're trying to destroy almost brutally all restraints. Let me put it this way, that uh, when in the show, O oh Calcutta, I haven't seen it, and I suppose I should go and see these things before I condemn them, the stage is set at many times to be full of naked people going through motions suggestive of intercourse and uh, other sexual uh, uh, activities. Uh, to me, that is not pleasurable, and this is not emancipation, and this is not sophistication. I think this is saying, let's brutalize the uh, whole thing. Do you see what I mean? I think it's, it is parallel with our brutalization in other directions, our delight in violence, in crime violence, in Western violence, our very high crime and uh, delinquency uh, rates. I think that we're in this strange period, uh, historically, uh, where we seem to have the impulse to bring everything down uh, clattering around us. I think, uh, here's another example. I read about a happening, uh, so-called, uh, a couple of years ago, in which two men come out on the stage with axes and they chop a grand piano uh, to kindling wood. And then a naked woman comes out and uh, they plaster her with uh, cooked spaghetti, uh, which she then scrapes off herself and hurls in the faces of the audience uh, that's watching. I'd say, this is not sophistication. This is not emancipation. Uh, this is the impulse to destroy all restraints. Well, I would say uh, civilization is made of restraints. We happen to be living in a cultural period where people s want less restraint, and that's all right. I think all civilizations have varied from more restraint to less restraint. Uh, human affairs are always swinging in a pendulum way. And this is not uh, surprising, but I think people now have got the bit in their teeth and say, no restraints. And I think they don't realize that that means no civilization. And uh, human beings, if they don't have civilization, they act worse than other animals. Other animals have their own limited pattern of behavior that's more or less dignified. Human beings have to be following some ideals and be restrained to some degree. Then they can uh, behave in a, uh, an, in a dignified and in a creative way. But if man throws this away and says, I'm nothing but an animal and uh, let's have it that way, uh, I think he's horrible, much worse behaved than any other animal. Is this a, a, a lack of a, a central theme? of the worth of the individual? Yeah, I, I think it's part of that because I think very definitely that man's lost his belief in himself uh, and uh, he's lost his own sense of dignity. I think it goes all the way back to uh, uh, the discovery of evolution a hundred years ago. Man used to think before that that he was a very special creation of God that had nothing to do with other creatures, that he was created in God's image and God had a special faith in him. And I think this buoyed man up and uh, was the framework uh, for his view of himself. And then when Darwin said, uh, you're related to uh, other creatures, in the first place, I think man resisted believing that for a hundred years. He's only gradually allowed himself uh, to believe it. And it's in the 1950s and 60s that he's finally said, 
I guess I am an animal, uh, so let's not uh, try to pretend uh, anything else. I think this is a misunderstanding myself because uh, man is related to other animals, but he's definitely different. Other animals don't write poetry or build Taj Mahals or uh, write symphony uh, music, you know. Uh, these, these are the differences. Man, in this sense, has a soul. And um, uh, so I think he'd better recognize not only that he's potentially vicious, but he's got to recognize that he's potentially noble, and he's got to cultivate the noble, and he's got to be proud of the fact that he's civilized, not proud of the fact that he's destroying civilization. And our guest has been Dr. Benjamin Spock. Tomorrow, the 12th annual Iowa Rose Festival opens in State Center, Iowa. It does run tomorrow through Sunday, and there are some special features this year. We are going to have an opportunity to meet the uh, 1970 uh, Rose Festival Queen candidates in a minute and the 1969 Queen. But before we do that, let's hear more about the festival from Jim Jorgensen. He's the uh, parade co-chairman. And I think we want to know a little bit before we even get into this year's activities as to how the festival started, the flowers around us, the garden. Uh, Dorcas, yes, this started about uh, in 1959. This was the, uh, the brainchild, the idea of a Mrs. W.A. Norcross from Cedar Falls. Uh, having visited State Center and also being a member of the Iowa Rose Society, it was decided and thought to be a good idea that we should have a town in State Center named as the Rose Capital of Iowa. And it was through the efforts of Mrs. Norcross and the Iowa Rose Society that uh, bestowed that uh, title on State Center. And so this, it started at that time, and I assume that you are adding uh, roses to it uh, continually and perhaps to other parts of town. Oh yes, and every year we have to uh, replace some of the roses that don't make it through the winter and uh, through the efforts of organizations here in town and uh, individual efforts why I think the whole community takes a pride in our rose garden and our roses and the and I think this year probably has been hard on them at various times because some of the storms have uh, uh, not been the simplest thing but they have been worked on and uh, well taken care of what else is involved with the in addition to just being able to see the flowers as far as the rose festival is concerned well, we've got quite a, quite a deal planned for us now, starting tomorrow, Saturday, and Sunday. Uh, tomorrow night we have the uh, a horse show out at the city park. Uh, we have a teen dance, and uh, we have a two-bit review. This is being put on by some teenagers from a high school in Cedar Rapids. They were here last year, and they put on a marvelous show, just really great. Uh, Saturday, of course, we've got the parade at 1030 which I am co-chairman of. And uh, we're gonna have a real good time. We've got some outstanding drum and bugle corps coming in from as far as Clinton. And uh, later that afternoon, they're gonna put on an exhibition out at the local high school as to uh, an exhibition drum and bugle corps contest. Now this is the first time you've had this, isn't it? Yes, this is kind of a result of putting together the parade and we find that it's somewhat difficult in the summertime in as much as uh, high school bands are not, uh, shall we say, functioning in the summertime. Uh, uniforms are at the cleaners and the band directors on vacation. So we find that a parade is outstanding if we can have marching units. And uh, so we've solicited and we've got these drum and bugle corps that are gonna come in and help us make an outstanding parade along with other local drill teams and uh, local efforts uh, from the community as far as floats and bands and kids and we're gonna have a good time. Well now how many units are in that? I think it's about nine aren't there? We have approximately eight or nine 
Drum and Bugle Corps, and Color Guard units that belong to the Iowa Uniform Groups Association. Now hopefully, next year we can get perhaps twice as many of these units in here and hold an official sanctioned Iowa Uniform Groups Drum and Bugle Corps contest along with our Rose Festival. That would be real nice. I hope so. Now going on to Saturday evening and, and uh, the activities. We will have a band concert Saturday evening. Uh, we have a speaker in the Rose Garden uh, Saturday afternoon after the parade. Uh, we will have the coronation of the 1970 Rose Queen that Saturday afternoon. As I said, uh, 4 o'clock we will have the Drum and Bugle Corps exhibition. At 8 o'clock we will have the Iowa String Quartet, which will perform at the St. Paul's Lutheran Church here in town. Uh, this is a group of uh, four gentlemen from, I believe it's Iowa City. And they have been on a world tour, and it's something different. We hope to offer something to everybody. So the Iowa String Quartet will be here on Saturday evening. And then on Sunday, uh, it seems like these tractor pulls are beginning to be real exciting to people. So the Central Iowa JCs here in town will be putting on the tractor pull at 1 o'clock on Sunday. So there's going to be a little of everything for somebody. Right, and we have just, uh, I think, uh, slightly gone over part of the things that are important because I think there's probably, oh, a carnival, and if I see that there's a square dance and right. some of these things, and so right. they'll have to get the program and come to get the rest right. of it. Right, right. Now, I'm wondering if we shouldn't go ahead and meet some of the, the uh, girls, but before we do, just in case uh, well, I don't get back, uh, it's very nice of you to uh, invite us over, and I hope that the parade goes well. Thank you very much. Thank you. And the 1969 uh, Rose Queen is Erin Maui, and she is from State Center, and your reign is almost over. Yes, it will be on Saturday. And what have you been doing this last year? I've been in four or five parades. We had an unsuccessful attempt at one just Friday afternoon, an unsuccessful attempt at Dr. Max <laughs> and all kinds of things. Right now, where do you go to school? I go to Iowa State University in Ames. Mm -hmm. And your parents? Mr. and Mrs. Dan Malloy of State Center. And so that actually Saturday afternoon you will be giving over your crown to uh, one of the other girls that we're meeting. Yes. And I'm sure that you've had a good year and we'll be glad to pass it on. I have. It's really been fun. Good. Now, uh, these are the five finalists. And in, no one knows at this particular point uh, which one will be the Rose Queen. But our five finalists start with Janet uh, Jackson. Yes, that's right. From Melbourne. Yeah. Your parents? Mr. and Mrs. Sam Jackson. Now, what are you going to be doing next year? Well, I hope to find a job, <laughs> make some money. <laughs> Any particular field or just... Um... Secretarial. Well, lots of luck and lots of luck tomorrow. Thanks a lot. And Lynn uh, Shepard? Shepard. And you are from? State Center. And your parents? Mr. and Mrs. Reuben Shaper of State Center. Now, what are you going to do next year? I'm going to be going to nursing school on Des Moines Methodist. Mm -hmm. I'm a Methodist. Now, actually, all of you are seniors. Yes. Do you have to be seniors to be able to enter the contest? We don't have to be, but they usually are. Mm -hmm. Well, again, I say good luck to all of you. Uh, then there's uh, Becky Cooper, right? That's right. And where are you from, Becky? I'm from Melbourne. And your parents? Mr. and Mrs. Gary Cooper. And what are you going to do next year? Uh, I'm going to go to Marshalltown Community College. It's a small junior college there. And do you have any idea what you want to study eventually or not? Uh, not really. Maybe some sort of journalism. Mm -hmm. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> and then you'll see whether you have an active here, depending on what happens on uh, Saturday. That's right. <laughs> right. And thank you. Thank and you. then um, it's Patty Gray, isn't yes. it? Yes. <laughs> and now State Center happens to be your home. Yeah. Well, I live outside of State Center on a small farm. Mm -hmm. And your parents? Mm -hmm. Mr. and Mrs. Roger Gray. And what are you going to do next year? I'm going to go on to Iowa State and major in psychology. Uh -huh. And so uh, do you anticipate uh, working this summer uh, in addition to the hopes of the queen? No, I'm just staying at home working for my dad. Oh, just staying home yeah. working for your dad on the farm. <laughs> Good. And then finally we have Becky Davis, mm -hmm. right? Right. And you from State Center. Mm -hmm. And your parents? Mr. and Mrs. Ed Davis. And what are you doing next year? I'm going to go to Iowa State. Studying what? Psychology. And uh, as far as part of your activities in the summer, are you working? What are you doing? Yeah, I teach swimming lessons in lifeguard. How did you get off now? 
Well, it hasn't started yet. It starts next Tuesday. <laughs> and so that you're not really in too bad a shape. Mm -hmm. On the vacation. <laughs> well, uh, as far as that's, I hope that, or I know that at least one of the five of them will be. <laughs> and they just, we just all got wet <laughs> because the wind puts the fountain in this direction. But that's part of the hazards of it. I'm uh, going for a queen or something they're, like that. They're young. They can take it. <laughs> well, what about us? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's warm enough. I don't think it'll make any difference. Right. Now, um, do you have the listing there of actually the drum and bugle chorus, or should we? The other thing is, is are there any of the roses that you are real aware of as far as the names uh, that people might want to look for as special ones? Well, when it comes to the actual names of the roses and their derivations, uh, Darkus, I'm I'll leave that up to some more experts that are a little more qualified than I. Although. We have roses here that are replaced every year, and they're donated by nurseries from all over the United States. And so we get just a vast variety of roses that many people don't have that can be seen here. Right, and I noticed that many of them have a sign on them of the All-American Selection, so that if you want to see some of those, I'm sure that you can, in addition to seeing the Queens, seeing the Drum and Bugle Corps exhibition on Saturday afternoon, and thank you very much, Jim Jorgensen, uh, parade co-chairman for the Rose Festival that will be held in State Center beginning tomorrow afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, girls.